Welcome everyone to Coaching a Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about leadership. And the idea of leadership is going to stem from who we are and who we're becoming because we want to be the ideal candidate in our life. But right now we're living in a world where we don't necessarily have good leaders. We don't have an abundance of leaders. It's almost a scarcity. Similar to how when I'm talking about the idea of finding like a manly man and women want to find manly men or very successful men, how there's not as many as there used to be. Well, the idea stems from leadership. If we don't have effective leaders, then who are we going to follow? And if we look at the traditional sense of what a relationship is, typically the man leads and the woman follows. Not saying that today that the woman has to follow, I'm sure she can lead too. But we have to learn how to be leaders. How do we be effective leaders? Going back to relationships, if you're a leader of a company, for example, if the company's not doing good, do you just abandon ship? Well, guess what? Divorces in America are initiated typically about 70% by women. So effectively, if the relationship is not going good, your leadership qualities is abandoning the ship. And that could be a hard pill to swallow because we look to be those effective leaders in our life, to follow these leaders, and then to keep on going. But there is a sense of leadership that we have to understand. And it's going to be, what are you not doing in your life? What are you afraid of? And we have to figure out that because when we look at hard work, well, we don't want to do it. We don't want to fix what's broken because that's too much work. We would rather start fresh, start new, because it's easier to buy something that's already pre-made than it is to make something from scratch. But when you're becoming a leader and you're learning how to be an effective leader, you need to learn what it's going to take to make the best dish possible. What is it going to take to be the best leader possible? Well, I have good news for you. Today, we're going to be having on a guest, Chris Natsky, who's going to be helping us on the idea of leadership. We're going to be talking about his story and then kind of getting into the different varieties of leadership and of understanding that when we have a mentor or a guide and we follow them, what is going to be the possible outcome? I'm interested to find out. Hope you are too. Here's that interview with Chris and myself. Welcome, Chris Nasky, to Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on. And today I have you on as a leadership coach. And I know you do more than that. And I know the accomplishments that you had in your life are a lot to say just in this brief introduction. So I'm going to allow you to do that. But in your own words, can you tell the world who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Chris Natsky. I'm uh, currently living in the Denver, Colorado area. I call myself a life leadership coach and keynote speaker. My background, though, which is probably unique, what you may be referring to is I'm an eighth degree black belt and former national taekwondo champion. So I use those principles of leadership, martial art leadership in my coaching and my speaking business. And what got you into martial arts? Well, you know, I started back in September of 1973, so quite a while ago. And at that time, there was a TV show that was a popular TV show called Kung Fu. And uh, it was about a Shaolin monk named Kwai Chain Kane that was walking across the American U.S. desert. And when you're 10 years old and you see him taking care of people with Kung Fu, you think it's the coolest thing you've ever seen. And so I literally begged my mom to let me go to my first class. And uh, when I got there, I felt like I came home. And I've been doing it ever since. And I always ask when someone finds something that they found like valuable in life is something they're passionate about. What was that process like for you as a kid when you saw it? Like, what was the feelings that were coming over you? Yeah, great question. I mean, like I said, I felt like I came home. I saw these people doing these amazingly powerful kicks and punches, et cetera. And it just felt like this is where I needed to be. And interestingly enough, as a young child, I always thought I was going to be an artist. I loved drawing. I loved doing things, you know, cartooning and things like that. And uh, as soon as I started martial arts, it felt like that was the art that I then embraced. And I loved the movement. I loved the kicking, the punching, the physical expression. But what I also came to learn is even at a very young age, really became adept and really embraced the philosophy. 
I love the idea of making myself a better person through an endeavor. And I also loved how much uh, or learned how much I love teaching. Becoming a better person is just one of those things that I think we all aspire to have in our life, but we don't commit to it. So we might not eat the right foods. We might not have the right people in our lives where we have toxic people or anchors in our life that stop us from being more. We have limiting beliefs in our life and we don't do the things necessary for us to get out of those bad habits or out of that poor mindset. And what I do as a mindset coach is I help people get out of that way of living in their limited mindset and then understand that things can be more positive in their life. When you were that young and you were learning discipline, how did that affect your upbringing when you started to maybe go into later schooling, if you went to high school, into college, and then going into your career? Oh, yeah. Tremendous impact. In fact, I can't think of a way that my martial arts didn't impact the way that I was growing up. I grew up, uh, full disclosure, in an alcoholic family. So I had a father who was alcoholic, so didn't have the best of male role models in my home. Not to say that my dad wasn't doing the best he could, but he just wasn't able to do it because of his disease. And so I found my male role modelship, if you will, through martial arts. And my Korean Taekwondo instructor became like my second father. And inherent within a martial art curriculum are all the things of discipline and respect and all those things that they're just inherent in everything that we do. And so as a result of that, I know it had a positive impact on how I viewed my role as a student in school. I later went on to become an all-star football player in the state of Wisconsin. It was all state, went on to play collegiately for four years on a football scholarship. So I always like to say that I was a good athlete. I think naturally I wasn't necessarily a fantastic athlete, but doing martial arts, not only from the mindset standpoint, but then also what it did for me physically afforded me these amazing opportunities, right? And so I was able to go to college on a scholarship when, you know, maybe I wasn't the most physically gifted guy, but I had the other intangibles that got me to succeed in that environment. And then from there, what got you into wanting to be a leadership coach? My background, I went to college on a football scholarship. Immediately out of college, I started working as a sales trainee and a management trainee for the largest consumer products company in the country. And I was actually recruited at my university to work for them and spent my first 10 years with them and had a fantastic time and had great success in that, got great training, et cetera. But in the back of my mind was, I wanted to own my own martial arts school. It was something from the time I was 11 years old, I knew I wanted to do. So I left that corporate world and I started my school. It became successful very fast. I mean, I think we, within two years or within one year, excuse me, we had, we had 200 students Within five years, we had 500 students. So it was very successful. But what I was also finding is, is that it was the intangibles of that work. It wasn't just teaching the kicking and punching that I loved. And I had some very successful students and I had success myself in say the tournament arena, but it was about the principles that I was teaching. And then as I went through that, I started feeling like there was something more I needed to do. And I was working with a coach. And I was, you know, basically searching for what's my next role. You know, what can I do to express myself? And he looked at me one day and he goes, you need to look at coaching. He goes, I've been observing you at your school. You're doing it all the time. You're not only having chats with students on the mat, but they're coming into your office. You're speaking with parents and adult students and you're coaching. I never correlated the two, but now I realize the work that I do as a coach is basically the same work I've always been doing as a martial arts instructor. And the value of a coach, I think a lot of people misunderstand because when I was kind of in a dark spot in my life and I was doing it all by myself, it was a lot of trial and error. I had to basically go read through tens, if not hundreds of books to find the answer for me to recover, to heal, to you know fix my life or get back on track. Even though I found a way to keep on moving, I was giving myself all these roadblocks constantly. I was like, oh, I have to do this. I have to do this. This makes money. Let me do this. I was already a seasoned teacher at the time. And so I left teaching to pursue money once again, because that's what I did out of college or, or out of high school, actually. I pursued money. And then I was like, I'll look at happiness later. And I was miserable my first two years. I was like, you know what? I need to change this. I should not be miserable in my life. And I chose to go down the teaching road, loved every day of going into schools and working with the children. But teaching is not what it was in the past, especially in the school system, in the public schools, where there's a lot of limits for the teacher. So the teacher has basically their hands cuffed and tied behind the back, and they can't teach the way they want or the way that they know is going to be beneficial for that kid. So I said, what can I do? 
what can I do to help the world? Because what's happening is we are creating kids that are eventually becoming broken adults. So by the time they're an adult, they have no idea what they want in their life. So they're looking for answers. They're looking for someone to help them, but they don't know where to look. And it wasn't until I had a lunch with one of my mentors. He was a great coach. He was a retired GE executive, big head honcho guy, you know, serious guy too. He was talking to me and, and this is when I'm like in my accounting business finance phase. And he's looking at me. He's like, every time you talk about teaching, you light up. And I was like, wow. Like, and then, and then he even told me you should be teaching. It wasn't that I had to be teaching in school. I had to be helping people somehow teaching people. Right. So similar to how you were teaching martial arts, teaching corporations or businesses how to be effective. It's the same aspect. And I always had a running joke when I was in high school. I knew I loved teaching and I kind of brought it on all the way to college that if there was a job to teach people how to tie shoes, I would do it because I just love teaching. But then I found out that I was a kindergarten teacher because I know when I was working with the kindergartners, they would always be running around with shoelaces untied. So I always had to pause class and I always had to help them out. The idea of teaching is so immense. And then you talked about the idea of having a second parent, a second role model. And I think that's so important to have because in life, we might not have the best parents, but the parents that we have do the best that they can. They might not be in the mindset of having kids or of dealing with it, especially if they didn't have a good upbringing themselves. That's their standard. So they're looking at that. When you're helping people in the beginning stages of coaching, what is the biggest thing that you notice when working with someone who had an upbringing of parents who might not have provided good discipline for them? Similar to how you grew up with martial arts and you didn't have a father who was a good role model per se. I'm not saying he was all bad, but of course there was aspects that you could have perceived as, okay, this is what a man does. You gain discipline somehow. So when you're starting to work with new clients who have maybe poor discipline because of poor parents. What are some of the steps that you do to help them regain good discipline? Well, you know, and I'll just say right off the bat, it's not just, it's just not um, compressed onto discipline. Here's what I find. I think that we all have our own version of our stories in terms of what happened with us and our parents. I obviously have my story, you have your story, Michael. And I think what holds people back many times when they've had maybe not the best experience of parenting when they were growing up, is allowing themselves to forgive that situation versus holding on to the resentments around that. And let me put it to you this way. I realized in my early 30s, it was a very profound moment that I had where I realized I was having a lot of difficulties with my dad, who still struggled with his alcoholism until, my gosh, I think he died when I was 38 or 39. So he died at a very relatively young age. And there were times in my life when I really struggled with him. In fact, the last year of his life, we didn't even speak because of you know certain circumstances. But what I had to come to the realization is, is that number one, that he did the best that he could. And I had an opportunity. I had an opportunity in this experience. I could either replicate what I had learned and role model as a father, or I could say, this is how it happened. This is what I'm learning from it. And as a result, I can choose to do things differently with my sons. And I can also choose to do things differently with my life. So in either example, my father was a great teacher. And so I had to come to grips with, he was doing the best that he knew how to do. And even like thinking, man, what if I chose him in order to learn all these lessons? And so he became one of my greatest role models for parenting because I learned the things that I didn't want to do. And I think what holds people back at times is number one is they hold on to that resentment. Then number two is to say, wow, okay, I can take this experience and what lessons do I want to glean from it? If I want to follow that same path where maybe I've grown up in a household that was undisciplined and people didn't follow through, okay, I can follow that path. Or I can say, wow, that didn't work for them. It didn't work for me. I have the power to change it now that I'm an adult. So that's how I'd, I'd answer that question. What it does then is it brings the power back to us. And that is as human beings, I think, where we're at our best. When we're not projecting blame onto our circumstances and other people, we're not victimizing ourselves, we become the victor. We become the victor from that situation. And you said something amazing. Follow the path, right? So you don't have to follow the path that someone's on. You can follow a different path. 
In our world today, we have a lot of followers. If we look at social media, for example, we follow someone on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. We are followers. We're not told to be leaders. It's difficult for people to understand exactly what leadership is if they're always following someone because they're always looking for someone. They're always looking for someone to follow. And if they can't find someone to follow, it's kind of like they're like, well, you know, I guess I just won't do anything because I don't know what to do. That critical thinking aspect of of who we are as people becoming leaders, I think is essential for growth in a human, especially in the mind. And what is happening today is that there's going to be a time when there's going to be no more good leaders to follow because everyone has been following. And so when they're at that junction where they can say, okay, I can go this way or I can go this way, there's a probability that they're going to go down that negative path because they might not have experience with that. You have experience like seeing your father, seeing how destructive that was. I have the same experience with my father. I knew not to go down that path. But then I have to ask myself, now that I'm raising my son, when he gets to that path, he saw me not on that path, but then he also sees his friends on that path. He can follow his friends and become that alcoholic per se, even though I was going in a different direction, doing the right thing because of embodied wisdom or wisdom, I know not to do that. But he's learning, how do I live life? Because as a parent, especially, we want to instill leadership into our sons and our children. We want them to make the best decisions possible. But we do have to sometimes step back and understand that this is their life. They get to make their own mistakes. When we're trying to instill wisdom into young children or into people in general, what is the way that you do it in the sense of this is leadership, it's going to define you, it's going to refine you, but you don't have to choose it if you don't want to? There's a lot in that question. The first thing I would say is, is that as a parent, now I'm a parent of two grown sons that I'd like to think turned out pretty well. I had a, one of my teachers tell me probably about 10 years ago, he said, you need to understand that you're not responsible for how your kids turn out. You're responsible for being the best parent you can be. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is, and this is going to sound cliche, maybe to some of your listeners, leading by example, all right? Being able to, if you are talking certain concepts with your kids, leadership, the discipline that they need to exhibit, the compassion toward others, the initiative to make things happen in the world and going through their fears and taking proper risks, you need to be able to demonstrate that yourself. It's one thing to communicate that verbally, but it's yet a whole other thing to be able to demonstrate that. And that's what my experience is. And my sons have been able to watch me. Now, have I been perfect at it my whole life? Absolutely not. But I like to think that they've been able to see me lean into the things that I've been encouraging them to do. And I found the same thing as a martial arts instructor. Early on in my martial art career, I had a conversation with my Korean Taekwondo instructor, and he and I had this beautiful bond. His English was not very good, but I could always understand him. Early in my martial art career, I was around 14 years old. I had just received my first degree black belt, and he and I were sitting there, and I asked him a question that I already knew the answer to. You know how kids sometimes will do that to kind of test the adults? So in Korean martial arts, we have a term for instructor. So in Japanese martial arts, they would say sensei. Most people are familiar with that term. In Korean martial arts, the term is sabum nim honored instructor, honored teacher. So I was sitting across the desk from him. It was just he and I. And I said, sir, what does subumnim mean? Already thinking I knew the answer. And he paused. And then he looked at me directly in the eyes and he said, subumnim means father. And I tell that story to you now and I still get chills because I really believe he wasn't saying he was replacing my dad. What he was saying is if you're going to play the role as teacher, you need to, in my case, exhibit the fatherly qualities. And so that's what I really felt I did when I was teaching martial arts full-time in my school as well. I was doing the best to play that role. And it starts with not only talking about and helping instill character in others, but then it's walking the talk of those same tenets that you're speaking about. And when we look at the qualities of leadership or what it takes to be an effective leader, probably the same qualities is going to be to be an effective parent. When we look at those qualities, can someone learn them even later in life? Or is it something that if they didn't learn at a young age, it's going to be very difficult for them to learn? Yeah, it's a great question. I think yes, of course, because we can always change and expand and grow. And we're only as good as we really know we're ourselves to be able to be at that moment. Are there some people I think that are more inclined 
to have natural leadership abilities? I would say yes. But man, it does not mean that we can't learn those lessons and learn those qualities. In fact, some of the greatest leaders that I've come in contact with are ones that had some pretty difficult pasts. But now, and in fact, they can even relate better to people because they haven't lived this rosy life. They've lived some very difficult moments, but now they can say, hey, this is what I learned from those experiences. And please don't follow me on this. Follow me in the way that I've learned, which is a much more uplifting way of life. And you said something that was hinting at the idea of struggle, where a person goes through struggle and then they try to, of course, mitigate it in future generations. So if I'm having a hard time doing this, my goal is to make the next generation better, right? So we pass the baton. There's often sometimes you see a picture quote of like a father and he's a bunch of puzzle pieces and he's giving the puzzle pieces to his kids. So he's helping their kids be complete. And he might not be complete, but his goal is to make sure his kids have the best possible future. And that's what my dad did. He had a rough time being a father because he didn't have that father experience. He didn't have positive role models. Growing up, he had his friends and he had his mom. That was it. He didn't have a sensei. He didn't have a martial arts instructor to help him learn discipline, to help him learn how to be a man. He had a lot of negative role models in our life. And I think what happens when you have a lot of negative role models in your life is that you develop negative leadership qualities. You learn how to be this type of person. I'm not sure about you, but I can recall back in my working history when I had bosses, how many terrible bosses I had. They might have a successful business, but they don't understand people. It's more of, okay, I'm all about the money. They might mistreat people. They have a hard time putting themselves in other people's shoes because maybe they might think that if I can do it, then you can do it. Or the mentality is, what am I paying you for? So it's two negative qualities right there in leadership. Can we talk about the difference between poor leader and a rich leader in the sense of mindset? Yeah, well, you give a couple of great examples there. What was coming present for me is that I think that most leaders that are acting in the way that you describe, they're not uplifting the people that are working for them, they're maybe putting them down, et cetera, is almost always a projection of what's going on inside of them, okay? Their poor self-image, their lack of confidence, their lack of faith in themselves. And so what they do is they have a tendency to project that onto others, which makes the entire situation bad. I think one of the most important aspects of any good leader is to first be able to work on themselves and what I would call self-leadership. So what are the aspects of yourself that need to be looked at? Where do you need to shine the light on yourself? Where are there places for you to up-level? And where can you take those experiences and then convey them in a positive way to help other people? One instance where you were talking about negative leadership comes from an aspect of fear. There's not enough. You need to treat people poorly to get them to perform. Some of my best coaches were the ones that didn't yell the most, but they were the ones that really understood what inspired and motivated me, and they touched that chord. And I always love also, I think this is a super important concept and distinction. Obviously, within leadership, the people that we are leading, there is something, particularly in the coaching world, that we call the idea of accountability. And I think it's important for leaders to have people that have their people hold them accountable just as they're holding their people accountable. But I just want to do a little play on words, which I think is super powerful, is rather than hold each other accountable, what if we held each other capable? What if we held each other capable? Meaning that we helped each other understand the vision of our most empowered state and said, okay, if that's the way you want to show up in life, now I'm going to hold you to that standard. So it's not this pejorative, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to make sure you do everything you said you're going to do kind of negative way. It's about, wow, I see greatness in you. You see greatness in me. Help hold me to that standard. Now there's a positive spin to that. And I saw that for decades teaching martial arts. Because one of the things we always instilled on my instructors and my staff that we teach is already see the black belt in front of you. What do you need to do to get that student to that level? But already see the black belt in front of you. And sometimes some of the most amazing transformations happen, particularly with kids that had no balance, no self-confidence, no discipline, et cetera. But we held them to that standard of greatness and inside themselves, and they became some of our best students in black belts. I think the same thing happens in business and teaching and life. In martial arts, there's a lot of structure on form. This is how we do it. This is how you should be at the end or the beginning of your move. This is an example, right? So we're showing them examples and you're doing these moves and then they replicate it. And there's these things that you tweak. 
here and there, do this instead, do this instead until we can get the best form that they can do at the time. And then maybe even later in life, they perfect it, they go on to master it per se. Is there a perfect form in martial arts? And is there a perfect form in leadership in the sense of, is there a perfect leader? I think using the word perfect or perfection is always a dangerous thing to do. I don't think that in almost 50 years of martial arts, I've ever thrown a perfect sidekick, for instance. However, and this is a distinction I make with my students all the time, is there's a huge distinction between perfection and excellence. So excellence is being to hold myself to that standard and striving for the very best, knowing that I may fall short. Because what happens when we are looking for perfection, this is my point of view, it can oftentimes freeze us from taking action because we're afraid of making that mistake. We're not going to show perfect. And I'm saying that, Michael, from total experience of doing it myself, right? But when I realize that the best way for me to grow was actually make mistakes, that was a mind blower for me. Years ago, when I first started public speaking, this is 10, 12 years ago, I was on the phone with my mom, love my mom. And I was complaining to her that my speaking business wasn't growing as fast as I wanted to at the time. And she sat and she listened. And as I vomited out all my problems and all my despairs, as it wasn't moving forward fast enough. And after she let me do that, she said, so you want to be one of those motivational speakers, huh? I said, yes. She goes, do you think anyone's going to want to listen to you if your life has been perfect and you've never had to overcome any challenges and you've never made any mistakes? Oh my gosh, it just blew my mind, right? Here I was thinking that in order to be an effective speaker, I had to be perfect in front of an audience. That's the last thing I needed to be. I need to be authentic in front of an audience. Yes, share my successes, but also share my challenges, my difficulties, et cetera, because that made me relatable. And I think that's a super important aspect of leadership. When you know that you have a leader that has their own things that they're working on, their own challenges they've needed to overcome, you relate better with that person. You take their advice better. You take their leadership better because you know that they've been through it themselves. A lot of people run from this fear of failure. They are afraid to make mistakes. They don't want to look bad in front of people. When a leader can embrace failure, what do you think happens in the whole realm of who they lead? I think what happens is, first of all, it, it exponentially expands their power. And I'm not saying their force, I'm saying their power, right? There's a distinction, right? But it expands their power. As I mentioned before, they're relatable. They're seen as someone that can be trusted because I think most people will try to hide their warts, if you will, right? I don't know about you, but some of the people that I have the greatest respect for are the ones that have had deep struggles, but have come up on the other side. I always have this deep, and I'm sure it's because of my background. When I hear someone's story who's overcome drug or alcohol addiction, and they're really working their program, and they're like, man, I totally screwed up, but here's where I am now. I have the immense respect for them. And I'm sure it's given on my background. But when we're in that place, what it does is it expands our ability to reach and lead others and to positively influence them. Leadership to me is in force. Is there times that we need to be in our strength and drive ahead? Of course. But I think from the long term, it's all about leadership is about positive influence. And when you're able to create a relationship with the people you're leading and they trust you, they see that you're looking to hold them capable. My experience is they'll follow you anywhere, but it isn't a manipulation. It's about expressing who you really are and then also accepting them for who they are. I think sometimes when people look at failure or the fear of failure, it's oftentimes perception because they're seeing what is the perceived danger. And it's difficult for the brain to understand that the fear of public speaking is going to be the same as the fear of being eaten by a lion, right? So it's the same thing to the brain is like, I'm not going to be here anymore. And the brain's purpose is to keep ourselves alive. It's easier for us just to conform. It is easier. It's, it's easier for us to be still. When we get off work from our nine to five, it's easy for us to sit on the sofa and watch TV. It's difficult for people to say, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do more in my life. One of the things that I often tell people who are stuck in this nine to five type of rat race and they're trying to get out, I tell them not to quit the nine to five. I tell them to add a little bit more to their regiment because an empire is not built from nine to five, it's built from seven to 11. And that two hours in between five and seven is for family. So when you're about to start working for the next three to four hours, however long you can go, you have that spark of your family right there pushing you because you're doing it for them often. If you don't have family, right? If you don't have someone you're working for or an aspiration, I always encourage you to look at yourself in the mirror and then ask yourself, what do you want to accomplish in your life? Because 
we can be that inspiration too. And I talk about belief a lot, where if you don't have anyone to believe in yourself, you can believe in yourself. You can always get a coach too. They're always going to believe in you typically, unless you have a terrible coach <laughs> who's just like, I'm not going to believe in you. Oftentimes, most coaches are going to have faith in what you want and they help aid you into that. I wanted to kind of understand your process and how you help people fall into leadership. The one thing I, I, I wanted to share too is you, before you even ask that question, and I think it'll blend right into it, is uh, one of the aspects that I do in my coaching is I also coach aspiring speakers. As you mentioned earlier, public speaking is the number one fear generally among adults. I think I've heard that number two is death. Jerry Seinfeld says, we'd rather be in the casket than giving the eulogy, right? But what I always tell people when I'm coaching them on speaking is I read several years ago, a scientific study that they took a look at the brain and they watched how the brain lit up relative to different emotions that people were feeling. So if they said they were happy, it lit up in a way. And if they said they were sad, it lit up in a very distinct, different way. So they went through all these emotions and they came upon anxiety, fear slash anxiety, and it lit up in a very distinct way. Well, they continued their study. Then they found, unlike any other example, that there was another emotion that lit up in the exact same way as anxiety and fear. And what that was, was excitement. The brain could not distinguish between anxiety slash fear and excitement. So the next time we're up against it, the next time we don't know if we can take this step, the next time this fear is bringing, uh, beginning to hold us down, what if we inside of ourselves said, man, I must be really excited about this opportunity. It puts a whole different spin on it. And that really is one of the important essences of my coaching. If we are never up against it in our life, if there's not something that's scaring us, we're probably not going for it enough, in my opinion. We're always going to have those instances that are scaring us at our very nature our egos are there to protect us. They're there to protect us from danger. And so if we see something as dangerous, we're not going to take action. But sometimes the things that scare us the most are the things we absolutely need to lean into the most because that's how we get our power back. For instance, when I was getting ready to leave my corporate job back in 1995 and doing quite well, as a matter of fact, and open up my martial arts school, I started having panic attacks. I mean, we're talking debilitating panic attacks that put me in the emergency room. And I realized after a while that I was creating all of that in my mind, all of that futuring of all the disaster that was going to come. I never even came close to it, but it was so real in my mind. And I think part of it was I felt everything had to be perfect. But once I was able to overcome that, now all of a sudden I started to see how other things open up. And now I look back at it and go, what took me so long? I knew I'd been wanting to be a martial arts school owner since I was 11 but I did the things that I thought I was supposed to. And it all worked out perfectly, right? Because the prior experience was great. But the fact of the matter was, is I was tremendously engulfed in fear and it had to do with this fear of making a mistake. I was so irrational with it, Michael. I thought, oh my gosh, if this thing fails, my professional career is over. I was 33 years old at the time, right? I was just getting started, but you couldn't convince me of that at the time because the fear was so intense. They say that life begins on the other side of fear. I find that to be very true because when we get past our fear, we get into our growth state and that can allow us to be more than what we were or be more than what we thought we were. It's important that people understand that fear is not the same as hardship. I think sometimes people are in a certain circumstance, like they have maybe bills to pay, they have mouths to feed, so they have kids and things like that. So they have to do something at the end of the day, they're exhausted. For that, I say, well, how can we make small incremental steps, right? What can we do, right? Because oftentimes we think of what we can't do. Oh, we don't have enough time to go work out because there's no time in the day, right? Well, we make time for what we value. And I think people are just giving themselves an easy out. And people love making excuses where excuses are the new trending reason why people don't be more than what they are is because they give themselves an excuse oh, I can't do this because my life is hard because, or I was late because if I'm late to something, you know, thank you for waiting for me. Or it's, I'm not going to bring it up. I'm not going to say that it was traffic. It was me not leaving earlier. I take ownership of my life because the moment I relinquish my ability to be on time or to be there mentally or physically, I'm giving myself an out, an excuse. And then that's a tough habit to break. So any aspect of your life, whether it be in your career, in your relationships, in your personal life, how you show up, 
you have to take responsibility. When you have this type of leadership mentality, you're almost being that trailblazer. You're taking the helm, but you're not putting everyone on your back in the sense, I need to carry this team to victory. It's that you have your team and your team is capable, as you said, and you allow them that freedom. And I strive every single day to be the leader that I would want to follow. And I try to be the father that I would want to follow. Not saying that these employees or my kids are going to look at me and say, oh, you know, I'm going to follow him. I just want to emulate what I would want to follow. And if they want to follow it, then that's good on them. If they don't, there's no condition for if they don't. That's on them, right? This is their life again. They get to choose how they want to live. But it's important for me to uphold that standard for me because I believe that walking the walk and talking the talk is the same thing. I believe if you can't do that, then what are you doing? And oftentimes when I have coaches on, I always make sure that they're also walking the walk and talking the talk. Let's use fitness as an example. If you're 300 pounds overweight and you're telling people that they need to be more in shape, you're a hypocrite, number one. And number two is like, they're going to see that. Wait, this person's not even doing it. So why do I have to do that? Versus if you have someone who is achieving at a higher level, it pushes everyone to achieve at a higher level. And I kind of wanted to go into that as when you have a leader who's achieving at such a high level, look at Elon Musk, for example, he does so much in his 24 hours every single day, and he has accomplished great things in his life. And he has teams or he has people who work for him who also exceed at a high level. What is the correlation to having a leader who chooses to exceed at a high level and then having those people follow? So the, those employees or those family members, they see that and they admire it. I like to kind of give the example of a sports player where we look at Michael Jordan, and you have all these kids saying, I want to be like Michael Jordan, or you have like Kobe, for example, I want to be like Kobe. It's like they look up to this person as that guidepost. And when we look up to that leadership as that guidepost, because they're doing exactly what they say, they're talking the talk and they're walking the walk. I want to kind of get your perspective on that. Oh, I, I think it's 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 immensely important. I think that most, if not all organizations are a reflection of their leaders. I'll speak from my perspective in the martial arts world. So I do a lot of coaching with martial arts schools. And invariably, when I go in and I work with a school owner, their staff, and then I go to watch their classes, and I get to just get a feel for the school. It's an absolute reflection of the person on top. I can't think of an example of where that hasn't been true in my 45 years of, of being involved in martial arts instruction. And I think that happens in families. I think it happens in relationships, et cetera. Now, again, there's the distinction between perfection and excellence. We want to strive to be our best. But I remember very early on in my martial art career, the hours of a martial arts school owner are basically second shift, right? You have classes that begin right after school. Your last class will generally end around eight or nine at night. And then many times that's when I, when I first opened my school, that's when I would eat my dinner. So I'd work and then I'd eat my dinner and probably ate too much right before bed. And I started putting on a little weight. I didn't look the very best. I wasn't tremendously overweight, but I was getting a little bit fluffy, right? And I remember one of my friends said, you know, you have to remember as a martial arts school owner, you're a professional athlete. And I was like, oh my gosh, he's so right. I mean, for the exact reason that you were talking about, if I'm going to be encouraging someone to be the very best that they are physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, I have to be working on that same thing. We have a, a saying in martial arts, it's called KANAI, an acronym. It stands for Constant and Never Ending Improvement. So it's our responsibilities first as leaders to be working that. And it's from that place that then we can inspire and lead others. But it always has to start with ourselves, always. Because people will detect the disconnect, whether it's right in front of their eyes or it's something they feel under the surface. It's almost the same thing goes with uh, public speaking. If you're not being authentic, if you are doing something I would call translating versus speaking from transformation, right? If you're just parroting things you've heard before versus having and speaking from your own experiences, an audience will shut you off within minutes of your talk because they'll know something's not congruent. So I think in leadership, the same thing is important for us to do is to be authentic, always be working on ourselves and lead from that place because that's where the power is. And what's your idea on the concept of fake it till you make it? Faking it connotes that you're not being authentic. So let me give you my little spin on that. Several years ago, I was in a leadership conference. It was a one-month leadership conference. 
Yeah, there were people from all over North and South America. And one of the first times we were all seated together, the facilitator of the event came in and he looked around the room and he said, most of you are living your lives backwards. And I thought that was an interesting statement. He said, most of you are living your lives from a perspective of have, do, be. When I have enough money, then I'll do what I want to do and I'll be happy. When I have more time, then I'll do the things I told my kids I would do and I'll be a better parent. When I have more customers, then I'll do the expansion of my business and I'll be successful. And he said, there's nothing wrong with these outer things that we're striving for. But he said, the people that have really got it going, the ones that are feeling and experiencing success, both professionally and personally, they turn those words around. They look at life from a perspective of be, do, have. So if you want more courage, more collaboration, more love, whatever it is you want in your life, start being that way. Start that way of being. Then do the things that are consistent with that way of being, and then you can have what you want. So that would be my little spin on fake it till you make it. It starts with our essence. It starts with our being. You know, any martial art champion starts with the belief inside themselves first. Now, I think that the being and the doing can work in conjunction with each other. So I'm not advocating that you just sit on your couch and get in a sense of being that way. You have to take action. One of my teachers told me one time, whatever term you want to use for this, he used God, but it could be spirit, universe, whatever, meets us at the point of action. So it's when we begin taking that small step that's when we start getting met with this amazing power that's bigger than ourselves, but we have to take the action. But it does start with that sense of being. It might be being proactive and then taking the actions so you can have what you want. Leadership is all about taking good action and proper action. And you can take poor actions and still be a leader, but the sense of being a positive leader and surrounding yourself with people who support you and have your back, I think is more important than having people who fear you. And the idea of making people fear you because you're powerful exudes almost a weakness because we are showing ourselves in the light of, if you don't fear me, then I am not a leader or I'm not powerful in the sense of we should, again, kind of like what you said earlier, step into our power and understand our worth, understand our value, and then we can move from there. Sometimes people have it backwards, as you said, with the have to be way of thinking. And it's important that we switch that around. And I love what we talked about today. And I tell people that you can go on this journey of life alone. You don't need anyone. You can do trial and error and you can make it. You can be successful at the end of it, maybe even in the middle. But if you have someone, uh, a coach, mindset coach, a leadership coach like yourself, you can get to that place so much quicker. I encourage people to not choose waiting, but to choose action and to take action, reach out to you and to figure out how can they begin their life truly versus I'm just moving through life because there's a purpose in life and you just have to find it sometimes. So if I can from you, Chris, can you please share with us any last words and then please tell how the audience can find you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what you were just saying there, Michael, made me think of something that I oftentimes share in my keynote talks and I call it the 1% solution. So it really has to do with taking action. If you think about it, if you committed to yourself to being 1% better at any activity each day over the course of one year, 365 consecutive days, at the end of that 365 days, you would be mathematically, it's been proven 37 times better than when you started. Only 1% each day, which is a pretty small increment. But where it gets really powerful is if you expanded that out to two years. So now two years, and many people say, well, I guess I'd be 74 times better. Not at all. You'd be 1,400 times better because your good habits and actions, they don't add up, they compound. And if you did that for five consecutive years every day, you'd be 76 million times better. So thing that I would leave everyone with is this, is where do you have an opportunity to get 1% better each day? And whatever that is that you choose it to be, because when you have that consistent action and you take those consistent actions over time, that's when massive results happen in your life. That's where transformation occurs. Sometimes it happens in a big bang. But like most people say, it took me 15 years to become an overnight sensation. It's that consistent action. So that's what I challenge everybody. And, and if they're interested in getting to know me a little bit better, taking a look at my programs, and also subscribing to my weekly blog called the Mind of a Champion Tip of the Week, all they need to do is go to my website, chrisnatsky.com. So that's www.chrisn as a Navy. ATZs and zebra ke.com. And they can reach out to me as well if they want to have a chat. 
Perfect. And I will throw all of those links in the description box below so people can easily find you. They can easily sign up for your newsletter, check out any programs that you have going, any workshops that you have going in the future. The idea of becoming a leader in your own life, in your own right, is going to spring you forward so much more than if you just did it by yourself. So invest in yourself and that small investment, again, is going to compound to so much more in your life. It might be a momentary hardship where you might have to give up your Starbucks for a year. But guess what? After that year and you can buy as much Starbucks as you want, it's because you decided that I'm going to make a small sacrifice today for the bigger picture tomorrow. And that bigger picture is your best self, finding yourself to be the leader that you should be rather than the person you are today. I want to thank you so much, Chris, for coming on coaching this session. A great conversation today. All right. Thanks, my friend. I enjoyed it. All right, everyone, I'd like to thank you so much for watching the interview with Chris and myself. As you can see, he is going to be a great motivational speaker, a great leader in the sense of helping people get to a better life. And he has walked the walk and he has talked the talk. He has raised two wonderful children. That is a testament of understanding that he has done many things in his life from being a father to being a leader to being a business owner we can learn a thing or two from what he has done and what he has accomplished. And he is so right. When we take a look at our life, it's not about looking at all the pretty things and taking all those Instagram photos of when we look the best and when we look like we have all this makeup on, we have the best outfit and there's no wrinkles in our shirts and our clothes and things like that. It's not about being perfect. It's about understanding that life can be practical in the sense of where we are today is going to be different than where we were yesterday. We might not be 100% today. We might not have been 100% yesterday, but we understand that and we hold ourselves accountable. And it's so important for us to say to ourselves, where am I? Because if we don't do that, then we're going to have a hard time figuring out where we want to be. And I love the idea of the have to be type of thing, because if you are always trying to figure out what you want to have in your life, then you're not going to be that because you're always giving yourself the longer road versus being what you want and then going accordingly to what you need or what you would like to have. For me, what I would like to be is I would like to be in the moment. I would like to be at peace. I would like to be that leader that I would want to follow, that person that I would want to emulate. And it's not that you have to do what I do. I don't believe in the idea of what I do is the right way. And I always tell my clients when they want to easy out, they say, Michael, I want you to tell me what to do, and I want you just to make sure I do exactly what you say. But in reality, it's not me telling you what to do. It's me understanding what you want and then me helping you facilitate that. Because if I'm over here giving you stringent directions and who you should become and you need to follow this, and if you don't do it this way, it's wrong, I'm going to be like everyone else. Because what I'm trying to do with you is create a unique opportunity for you to grow in a different way that no one else in the world has. Because what you have to offer is different than what I have to offer. And what someone else has to offer is going to be different than what you can do and what you can offer. It's important for you to understand that your value is going to be in you. You just have to understand, do you want to take the step into leadership and taking ownership of your life and taking back the wheel from the world and of these excuses and these habits and these poor decisions that we have been making all of our life? We can choose better. We can choose something more in our life. We just have to attain that mindset and we have to get into the way of thinking that is going to be more inclined to leadership and more inclined to understanding that people are not stepping stones that we step on to try to be better. We're not in competition with other people. We're in competition with ourselves. How can I be better than the day before? How can I be better than last year? We're going to be looking at the idea of New Year's resolutions. We're going to say, oh, this year is going to be my best year yet. And I encourage that. But at the same time, if last year wasn't your best year yet and you told yourself you're training your subconscious mind to just use your words as a pleasantry. And in life, those pleasantries are not something that we should be just giving ourselves. We should be having action. We need to take action. How do we take action? Well, I encourage you to take action today. You can like the video. You can say, I'm going to take action in the comments below. You can Send your mom or your partner a message saying, I'm going to take action today towards something. And then you make sure that you remain accountable. And if you need help remaining accountable, I encourage you to check out Chris. All his links are in the description box below. If you're struggling with your mindset and you're trying to figure out 
what steps you need to take and how you need to be, I encourage you to go to reverendconcepts.com and sign up for coaching, even a consultation and understanding where you are and then where you like to be and getting a roadmap. I think that's going to be a great first step, a great action that you can take in order for you to be more. And in my life, it's not about looking at all the good things that I have or all the bad things that have happened in my life. I use those experiences as a understanding of this was my life and I'm taking ownership of it. My life has not always been good and it has not been all bells and whistles. And when someone looks at my life, they say, oh, wow, you're so lucky. I mean, I am fortunate. I'm I'm totally blessed to be here speaking with you and to have this platform in my business and my families. At the same time, there's a lot to it. There's more than just what you see. A lot of times people see the private jets and they see the nice clothes and they see the jewelry or the nice car, but they don't see what's on the inside. And sometimes if you don't do what's on the inside, it can rot. So an apple that has been preserved with wax might have been rotten from the core. And by the time you bite into it, the outside is perfect, but the inside is rotten. And if your life is like that apple with the wax on the outside and it's providing a reflection to what the world wants to see rather than what truly is on the inside, then it's probably time that you dissect that apple, get rid of all the rot that's in your life and all the hardship, and you put it all together and you use that as your foundation because that's like your rock bottom. That's like your story. And your story should be told and you should be proud of what you went through. It's not about being perfect. It's about being who you are truly and then showing the world that that imperfection has something to say about you. I'm far from perfect and I don't even strive to be perfect. I know that each new day is an opportunity for me to be more, not perfect. How can I be better? How can I be more? And if you can get that mindset, if you can get that way of thinking, then qualities that you're looking for in your life are going to start to fall into place, leadership being one of them. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coaching in session at gmail.com. And I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone take care.